Thinking Aloud, conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with parapsychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today, I'd like to talk about what I think might be one of the greatest contemporary books ever written. Now, like contemporary, I'm thinking relatively long term since this book was published in 1954. And the title is The Ways and Power of Love by the great sociologist Pitterum Sorokin. Now, I have given a previous monologue, an in-presence monologue about Sorokin. I'm linking to it now. It has to do with the sociology of consciousness, and it goes into Sorokin's life story, his works, his history. But many people regard his book, The Ways and Power of Love, as being his greatest accomplishment. And I barely touched on it, if at all, in the previous monologue. He decided relatively late in his amazing career that we needed to study love. Uh, he noted very, very much the way I noted early in, in my own career, that if you want to study crime, if you want to study social dysfunction, war, disease, poverty, alienation, all of these things can be studied at universities easily. If you want to study consciousness, psychic functioning, intuition, and love, why there's very few opportunities. And uh, he was lucky to receive funding to set up the uh, Institute for Creative Altruism at Harvard University. He got funding from the uh, Eli Lilly of the uh, Lilly Pharmaceutical Company to, to do this work. And uh, this is a magnificent book. It runs 500 pages. I uh, am going to try and touch on uh, some of the highlights. And it it's not really about romantic love. It's about altruistic love. And uh, let's begin with the definition of love itself, of course. And I think he starts with a pretty simple definition. He basically saying, you know, naturally, we all put ourselves first. We're at the center of our own consciousness. It's natural to uh, think about our own self-interest. But love is when you put the interests of others as equal to or above your own. So, people who express creative altruism, ironically, and perhaps sadly, are typically martyrs. Uh, he refers, for example, to Jesus, to Gandhi, to Father Damien, who was a Catholic priest who served the lepers in the leper colony on Molokai in uh, Hawaii at a time, I recall, that when it was still a kingdom. And uh, he contracted leprosy, which he expected to do, and he died amongst the lepers there. He was subsequently sainted by the Catholic Church when various miracles seemed to be associated with him. Another one of Sorokin's heroes, a martyr for love, is uh, the great Sufi mystic. I think we're talking about the 8th or ninth century uh, in uh, Iran, Al-Halaj, Mansur Al-Halaj. We've spoken about him in an interview with uh, Jason Giorgiani about esoteric mysticism of, of Iran. And Al-Halaj is the one famously uh, who said, uh, I am the truth. And, and, and he, he was brutally murdered for that. And he uh, apparently started the practice of the whirling dervishes. He would spin around himself saying, I don't have to go to the uh, Mecca to circle around the Kaaba. I am the truth. I can circle around myself. Well, that, that was heretical. And one of the things that Sorokin points out with regard to these martyrs is they have a universal love, a love for all of humanity. I think it's a sentiment that I've expressed in, in these monologues as well, an identification with all and everything, with everyone 
with every soul, with every sentient being, with the entire universe as a single conscious entity of which we are part. And, and the problem with that, that Sorokin points out, is that often when people develop a sense of altruistic love, it becomes tribal. It becomes love for my people, love for my family, love for my nation at the expense of someone else's. And uh, that's why the uh, people who express such universal love become hated. Christ himself said, you know, if you follow me, you will become hated because uh, those people who, who are considered great patriots because of their identification with a particular segment of humanity uh, dislike at times the uh, those who express universal love. Uh, Sorokin points out, for example, that in his study of the Catholic saints, about a third of them were martyred. But he points out, and this is uh, one of the crucial points of this book, that love begets love and hate produces hate. And he means this in the political arena. He's talking about nations and empires, and he gives many, many, many examples. And we've talked about such examples in other programs. I've interviewed uh, Stefan Schwartz, for example, uh, uh, about his book, The Eight Laws of Change, and about how some of the most significant changes uh, occurred peacefully, like the liberation of India under Gandhi and, and the philosophy of nonviolence, how crucial that is for permanent, long-lasting change. And um, there are many other wonderful examples of people in, in the most dire of circumstances. Now, the interesting thing is this to me. He talks about, you know, what, what are the qualities that enable these martyrs to persist in, in their loving behavior, even while they're being persecuted. It sort of reminds me of a story that I, I brought up uh, in a previous In Presence monologue in, in which I told about the time a, a couple of people I was uh, sharing a house with, uh, and we were having a dispute, and, and they were furious with me uh, for calling out their dishonesty. And one night around three in the morning, they came into my bedroom and um, tossed boiling hot water on me and threw a knife at me, told me they were going to kill me. And for some reason, I felt possessed by the Spirit, I have to say it this way, uh, of Jesus Christ, although I'm Jewish. And I just stood up in my bed totally naked. It wasn't a bed high up off the floor. It was a mattress on the floor, as I recall. So I didn't lose my balance, but they saw me in a state of perfect innocence. And, and they just, you know, turned tail and, and got out of there as fast as they could. But there are many such examples in history. For um, one, a famous one is when Attila the Hun in the year 452 AD came with his army to sack Rome and could have done it. Uh, but the emperor of Rome sent out an emissary. It was Pope Leo. Leo the first, and uh, he met with Attila, and Attila took his army and just turned around and went away. Now we don't know exactly why historians have puzzled over this for a long time, but there are many other examples of people who share a, an open heart and turn vicious robbers or criminals or warriors in, into peaceful friends. Um, even animals, even vicious animals. Uh, Sorokin recounts the story of Helen Keller, a woman who was deaf and blind and very famous in her day. And uh, she insisted on going into a lion cage 
with a lion and uh, she wanted to experience the lion and they let her into the cage and uh, she walked in and, and began touching this lion. The lion roared, but she was deaf. She couldn't hear the lion. The lion never harmed her. It allowed her to touch it and uh, have that experience of connection. And I think it was uh, that animals instinctively sometimes feel that sense of pure innocence and and pure love. Uh, and of course, you can go on the internet today and see many, many examples of individuals who are able to uh, be in intimate contact with wild and sometimes aggressive animals. Now, Sorokin talks about the importance of love in terms of the future of humanity. We know, and we've done many programs on the various crises that we're facing at a technological level, at uh, the political level, at the environmental level. Uh, humanity is facing various crises, and uh, Sorokin sees love as an antidote. He says that we need to marshal all of our unconscious, our conscious, and our superconscious resources to choose a destiny for humanity based on love, love of the whole. He suggests that we're at a turning point. It's very much like the book of Deuteronomy, <laughs> which says, I lay before you two choices. You can choose life or you can choose death. If you want to continue your behavior, you will destroy yourself. But it's not inevitable. It may be very, very difficult. You can look at the history of warfare on this planet and you'll, you'll see that almost every country has had, uh, spent, I don't know, anywhere from 20, 30, 40, 50 percent of, of its time engaged in warfare of one form or another. There's no denying the, um, selfish instincts of, of uh, inherent in our own biology. We're animals and we uh, will strive to protect ourselves and uh, we have natural instincts that lead us to uh, divide the world into insiders and outsiders. But that's not all we are. We have the potential to experience what Sorokin calls our supra-conscious mind. And it is from this supraconscious mind that we can experience universal love. And it is, in his opinion, this universal love that can save us from our own worst instincts and, and our own potential for self-destruction. It's a wonderful book. I highly recommend it, The Ways and Power of Love by Pitarum A. Sorokin. I recommend all of his books, including The Crisis of Our Age and also Social and Cultural Dynamics. Uh, Sorokin has been, ever since I first encountered uh, his work shortly after his death, as I recall, it was about 1970 when I first ran into him, and I think he died in about 1969. A great man. Uh, you know, the American Sociological Association gives out an award every year, the Pitterham A. Sorokin Award for the, the greatest contribution to the field of sociology. I only wish they studied his work as much as they honor the man. Well, let me close by asking you this question. How do you feel about universal love? To what extent are you able to experience yourself as one with everything and everyone? To what extent are you able to treat all other people, all other people the way you would treat yourself? And is this even in your mind desirable? I'll leave you with those thoughts. And once again, thank you for being with me.